we are continuing the series that we have been doing. The series that we started, this is our fourth week on this series. The series titled is My Good Shepherd. My Good Shepherd. But specifically in today's service, the topic of our conversation is the providence of the Good Shepherd. The providence of the Good Shepherd. And let me start by saying Happy Easter to all of us. He is alive. He is alive. He is risen. Never, ever, ever to die again. Oh, that, that, the thought of that just really gladdens my heart. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, from verse 10 to verse 14, John 11, 10 to 14, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. This is Jesus Christ talking about himself. Something he rarely do. Something that you can count on one, one hand how many times he talked about himself. But in this specific gospel, he said to us, I am not just the shepherd, not just a shepherd, not one of the shepherds. No, I am the good shepherd. And in case you're wondering, well, that's what you say. What differentiates you from the other shepherd down the road? He said, look, there are some people who are doing the work of a shepherd, but in their hearts, they are not shepherd. They are hireling. And how would you know them? As soon as the, the wolf is on the horizon, they run for their lives. But a good shepherd, a true shepherd, will stand in front of that to protect and to preserve his sheep. A good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. Just like Jesus did. He laid down his life for you and for me so that by his sacrifice, the wrath of God can be satisfied and you and I can be reconciled back to God. His sacrifice brought the great exchange where he took on the sin of the world and gave the world the gift of his righteousness. And that, my friend, is what differentiates him. That, my friend, is what qualifies him as the good shepherd. We are looking at the providence of this good shepherd. But what is providence? Providence is the sovereign divine superintendence of all things, guiding them towards their divinely predetermined end in a way that is consistent with their created nature, but all to the glory and the praise of God. Providence is divine, is sovereign, the benevolent of all things by God. Everything that you and I, we know and we will know about God. Everything about his promises, his covenants, his, his plans and his things, they are all embodied in his providence. In fact, everything that you re read or you hear or you learn in the scripture, they are undergirded by the providence of God. 
The providence of God is the manifestation of his divine care for you and I. The, his divine protection for us, his divine plan to direct us and sustain us towards a destiny that he has predetermined for us. He said, I know the plans that I have for you. They are good and not evil. And he, all he does throughout your life and my life is to guide us towards this destiny. His providence is the guidance and the care as predetermined by him and provided by him for your purpose and for my goodness. The true manifestation of good or bad is not about what it says or what somebody said about themselves. No, the true manifestation is about how how are they? How how is what they're saying measuring up with what they're what they're doing, and how are they using that to relate to and connect with and interact with people around them? There are many people in this world. You know them. I know them. Maybe I'm even one of them. Could it be that you are one of them? There are many people in this world defining and describing themselves as the shepherd, as the good shepherd. Some will even go as far as to say they are the great shepherd. After Jesus, he was there. But when you match what they're saying with what they're doing, especially how it relates to the sheep in their fold, then you begin to determine, is this person a shepherd? Or is this person a higher? Is this person a good shepherd? Or is this person just a good talker? Is this person somebody to, to, to lean on or somebody to run from? There's only one good shepherd, and that's Jesus Christ. The rest of us, we are just practicing. But within the fold of the practices are those who are higher limbs. They just a need for themselves. They don't care about the sheep. I had I had some, some somebody said once. In the days of Jesus, one man, Jesus Christ, fed five thousand men, not counting children and women. But what we have today is five thousand men, not counting children and women, feeding one man. That tells you he's not a shepherd. But she's not a shepherd. They are hirelings. How do I know that? The passage we read earlier on, in John chapter 10, from verse 12 to verse 3, Jesus distinctively just explained it to us. He said, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, see the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatter them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. The hireling. As soon as they see trouble, they run. As soon as you come to them for say this, they're gone because they are hired. And there has never been a better time to draw this distinction between a shepherd and a hireling like the time we're in right now. On a day like this, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, the Lamb of God who was slain for the sin of this world, as we remember his resurrection, as we celebrate his victory over death and the grave, as we rejoice in the knowledge that what he had, we have as well. As we are reminded about what he did, what it takes to be a shepherd, talk less of even being a good shepherd, what it takes to be a shepherd for the sake of the sheep to lay down his life. As we celebrate that today, we must remember 
that the relationship that we have with God through his son, Jesus Christ, is not just a head knowledge thing. It is deep in our hearts. And the manifestations of that is, is vivid in our lives. The good shepherd. My good shepherd. Your good shepherd. Jesus, the Christ himself, he stood in the chasm between God and man. That gap that was so wide, you can't put any bridge over it. No, he stretched forth, he spread wide his hands and built a bridge over it so that you and I, we can walk on that and cross over and be reconciled back to God. He paid the price for the sin of this world. He committed the ultimate sacrifice. When he took on your sin, when he took on my guilt, when he took on our sickness and our disease, when every punishment that is due to you and I because of the guilt of sin, when they were laid on him so that you and I can enjoy a day like this where we can put our hand on our hearts and declare we are God's children. Why? Because our good shepherd made it possible. He was made sin. Listen to this. Not that he committed sin. Not that he even was made to commit any sin. No, he was, he became the embodiment of sin. No wonder the Bible said on the cross, he was, he was ugly beyond recognition. Why? Because your sin and my sin, they were laid on him so that you and I can enjoy the benefit of his sacrifice. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who knew no sin was made sin. Not that he was made to sin. No, he became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God. I know when you hear most of what is being said in the world today, especially in a season like this, this Easter period, all you will hear is about, oh, he walked triumphantly into Jerusalem on, on Friday, and by Sunday, he was crucified, and then he was buried. And, and everybody concentrates, well, not everybody, most, most of what you will hear are concentrated on the last few days or few weeks of his life. And now, don't get me wrong, that's important. But you see, in order for you to understand, for you to gain a better understanding, rather, of what the benefit, what the providence of this good shepherd is, you must look beyond what happened from Friday to Sunday. You must cast your mind wide. You must look further. Because what happened between Friday and Sunday was a, the combination, the summary, the total, the, the final cap, the icing on the cake, as it were, of all that he has been doing before the foundation of the earth. So when we talk about the providence of the Good Shepherd, we must look beyond the Easter message. He died on Friday. He was buried on Friday. And on Sunday, he, was, he resurrected. That's true. But there is more to it than meet the eyes. From the beginning, from the inception of time, from when it started, before it started, how it started, the Good Shepherd, the Son of God, the Word of God, he already knew the end before it started. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In fact, he was there before the beginning began. 
He was already working out this master plan that we now see and we experience and we've been reading about, we've read about rather, concerning the Easter period. No, there is more before we got to the Easter period. For example, in the first place, do you know that God, the creator of all things, did not create man? He did not make, make man, he did not bring man into existence until all of the other creations have been completed. After he had created everything else, then he created man. He brought man into existence. Why? He, God wanted everything to be in place so that the man at the point of his inception will have nothing missing and nothing broken, will have no one, will have no nothing out of place for him. Man, the symbol, the image, the representation, the only thing that was made in the likeness of God came at the last minute. Why? Because God wants everything to have already been settled before you and I appear on the scene. Did you not read that Adam and... <clears throat> Excuse me. Adam and Eve, they were just having fun in the garden. And then God will come down in the evening and just have some sandwiches with them at the picnic. They were just enjoying life. That, my friend, was part of the plan of redemption. In fact, if you if you if you if 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 you are religious and you're thinking, well, where is that in the Bible? I'll tell you where it is. It's in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1 from verse 29 to verse 31, Genesis 1, 29 to 31 said, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given even green help for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. He created everything, and then he gave it to man. They are yours. In the same way, God finished removing and destroying and eradicating everything that could stop you and I or prevent us from being reconciled to him. He did, he completed all the things that needed to be done. And then he stretched forth his hand and touched your heart and touched my heart with the gospel of salvation. And we couldn't, we, we couldn't argue with it. Well, today I think you're stretching me. I mean, what do you mean? Look, let me let me ask you these questions. Have you ever wondered why it took you so long to know God now that you know Him? Have you ever asked yourself, so what was what I what, what have I been waiting for? Would what would you have what will what, what would have been your response to the gospel if it was presented to you six days or six months or a year before the day that you eventually accepted God to be your Lord and Savior? I can tell you, for years people were telling me about Jesus. For years, people were ministering to me about salvation. For, for months on the end, some of my best and closest friends all became born again with just like that. And that 
got me even more hungry. What's wrong with these people? Why are you all just so stupid and so mindless and so so easily persuaded that now somebody said Jesus and you all falling on your head? What, what are you crazy? That was who I was until that day. When that lady on that coach said to me, as it was in the day of Noah, when people said the flood wasn't coming, and then he came and wiped them all out, so it shall be in the day of Jesus. He's coming. And it's only those who accept him now who will be saved. Thank you for your time. That was all she said. And for the rest of the next three, four, five days, I, I was... I, I can't explain what happened to me. And the following Sunday, I got up, went to church. And before the pastor said, whoever wanted to, my hand was up, I was rushing down to the front of the altar because my time came. He prepared everything. He allowed me to fight myself to the point where my heart was ready. And once the seed was sown, from the 10th of February, 1992, till now and for eternity, he will always be my Lord. Have, can you just imagine your life? If I can just look back and look at my life from the point that I, 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 I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, what would have happened if I said, oh, I'm not ready now? It's not about me being ready. It's about everything that was removed. My ears was cleaned out. My heart was prepared like a good soul. And when the seed came in, I, uh, the rest is story. Oh, excuse me. In fact, when you look in Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter 1 from verse 15 to verse 16, he said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. When it pleased God, he, call, he, he revealed his son in me for the purpose that I am. I preach this same good news to those who don't know it. What am I saying? There is an appointed time for every man in God. There is an appointed place for every man in God. And in God's perfect timing, nothing can stop you. Nothing can change you. Nothing can derail it. That time will never be missed. That time will never be lost. Why? There's a divine hand behind the scene that is orchestrating and directing and coordinating and moving you into the right place at the right time to meet the right people so you can hear the right thing because now your heart is in the right place. Oh, glory. Secondly, the Almighty God, in his divine knowledge, through his divine wisdom and blessing, he knew that the fall of man is already guaranteed. And listen, the fact that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they catch God by, oops, what happened? It's the same thing in your life. It is not when you confess your sin that God suddenly, oh, wow, I didn't see that. I didn't even know you did that. Thank you for reminding me. He knew. Before you were born, he knew. Before Adam and Eve took hold of the forbidden fruit, God knew that that day will come and it already made provision for salvation. The, 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 the journey of salvation was put in place even before the foundation of the earth. 
the lamb was slain. Oh God. The lamb was slain even before Adam and Eve, even before God said, let there be light. The lamb was slain. According to Revelation chapter 5 from verse 11 to verse 13, he was slain before the foundation of the earth. The salvation package that you and I and the world is enjoying today was never an afterthought with God. It wasn't like, mm, what are we going to do about this? Let's see. What does the uh, consulting manual say? No. It was, it was like the safety net that God already put in place when you were going up on that rope to jump because God knew. Not that if you fall. No, he knew you would fall. So he put the safety net there. The salvation package was not an afterthought and just in case this plan didn't work um, well. No, it was there already as a predetermined solution. It was part of the providential plan of God for you and I not to be lost forever to sin and condemnation into the pit of hell. Let me ask you this. Imagine if the blessing of salvation was not there. If the grace of the free gift of his righteousness was unavailable. Can you imagine if you and I, let's say it's even available, but we have to work ourselves to earn what it takes to be forgiven and become the righteousness of God. Would there have been any chance in heaven or in hell or on earth that you and I will ever be qualified? Because we don't set the standard. God does. And his standard is there. And we are so far down in the bottom of the lake that we can't even touch the, the, the surface. The Bible says, even on our best days, with our best intention, putting in our best effort, our effort will still be like the filthy rag before a righteous God. But to prevent that, to save us from that shenanigans and all that headaches, because of his providential love towards you and I, he made the salvation plan. He put it in place. He put it on motion. He set it up so that when the time is right, for you, you walk into it. When the time came for me, I walk into it. When the time came for the rest who are yet to come in, they will all come in. Because this salvation, this gospel will be preached to the uttermost part of the earth before the end will come. Thirdly, the third manifestation of this providential love of God through this good shepherd there was never a time that man was left to his own device there was never a time when the love of God was taken away from man there was never a time when God turned his back on man. There was never a point when you and I were not occupying his heart. The good shepherd. Like all parents, you may think they didn't see you. You may think they don't know about it. You may even think they don't care about you. But trust me, they're watching. They're praying. They're looking. They, they are concerned. They have your love in their hearts. They care so much for you. From the first cry to the final breath, the love of God, the care of God, the blessing of God, and the eyes of God are on you and I. The trajectory of man's dealing with God as detailed in the Old from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament 
from Genesis to all the way to Revelation, when you read it, not from a religious point of view, not just so that you can know what is said in Hebrews and Daniel, when you read it from a point of, I want to know, you will see the, the line of God as it runs through the whole of human existence, pointing to one thing, the salvation of man. Like all good parents, when the child thinks, uh, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, if they love me, why is this and why is that? You can, you, you, let's see what Romans said. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 from verse 38 to 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Good Shepherd. What is he saying? You can go to the top of Mount Everest and dive to the bottom of the, of, of the Atlantic Ocean. The love of God will always be there. David said, where can I go from you? If I go to the rooftop here, then if I go to the bottom of the picture, go to the, where can I hide from you? In all your ways, in the entirety of your life and my life, the overriding factor that will always be present in our lives is the love of God. It is the benevolent of God is the the the, the un, unfathomable, unquestionable, indestructible the love that God has for us. A part of the manifestation of that love is the the sacrifice that Jesus had to pay, so that you and I can have life in abundance to the full until it's overflowing. See the true test of anyone's love is the manifestation of their power as it is demonstrated towards the love that they have invested in. You want to know whether a man or a woman loves their children. Now they've just slapped that child, they've just cursed that child out. You want to know whether they love that child. Put your hand on that child. Then you will see whether they actually love that child or not. And when you read through the Bible, you will see examples of, of the manifestation of the love of God, even in the face of all oppositions. Remember the story of Moses. Moses, a wanted man, a fugitive who ran from, from, from Egypt. And then one day God touched him. And Moses went back to Egypt. It's not... Going back to Egypt was not... It has nothing to do with Moses. The reason Moses went back to Egypt was not to show his faith before Pharaoh said, what are you going to do about it? No, the reason he went back was the love of God for his people, the children of Israel. He said, the cry of my people has come before me and I'm sending you to bring them out of that slavery. It is the, the overwhelming love for the people of Israel that prompted or that necessitated Moses to go back to Egypt. Remember the story of David. He was there just playing his harp in the woods. And then this lion came and this bear came and took his lamb. He threw the, the harp away and went after those things and he beat the daylight of them. Now, let me ask you. A chihuahua is on the other side of the road and it sees you working and they just go, whoa, whoa, whoa. and you just... <laughs> <laughs> you, you jump so high you could cross jump over the fence 
That's a chihuahua. But imagine David had to go and confront a lion and then a bear. No, he didn't do it just because he said, uh, Mr. Muzzle ought to show that I can't. No, he did it out of his, it's a manifestation and a demonstration of his love for those lambs. Just like the love of God motivated the Son of God to lay down his life for you. Esther went before the king. Even though it's contrary to tradition for you to go to see the king if you are not invited. He, she just went. And she even said, if I die, let me die. But this one, the people of Israel, the Jews must not be destroyed. Jesus and Christ, the good shepherd himself, he went on that cross. He paid the ultimate price. He gave the biggest sacrifice so that God's rod can be at peace, so that you and I can walk in the fullness of the righteousness of God. Why? Because of the love of God. Because of the love of God. So this Easter season, it's not just about bunny rabbit and Easter egg hunt and all the other things and chocolate and everything else we do. No, there is more to it. We must be reminded we must remind the world that we're in that it is a manifestation of the demonstration of the love of God towards this earth, especially towards you and I, so that we don't end up in a place that is destined for the devil and all its demons. The fifth demonstration of the providence of this good shepherd the fifth manifestation is, it, how can I say this? It goes beyond the point of salvation. Yes, it's good. It's a wonderful thing to be saved. But you see, God's plan is it's not just for you to be saved and then say, that's it, saw yourself out. No. His plan, his divine plan is, is to secure not just your eternity, but your sound mind, your good health, your vibrancy, even as you are in him. He raised Jesus from the dead. And that singular act of God of the Spirit of God raising Jesus from the dead, that resurrection is a confirmation to you and I that even when this temporary clay called body, when it's, when it falls down and is shed away, that's not the end of you. That's not the end of me. In fact, that's a transition to a bigger, better, greater place, closer to God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a demonstration and a confirmation of the power and the promises of God. When he said, if you believe in me, you will not die. And even if you die, you will rise up again. And to confirm, it, we saw it in the life of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, from verse 7 to verse 9. Romans 6, 7 to 9 says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. The death no longer has dominion over him. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Does his spirit dwell in you today? Do you carry the embodiment of the resurrected Jesus on the inside of you? And don't be afraid of death. Don't be concerned because it's just a transition.
Well, guess what? There's more. It's not just about you being born again. It's not just about you being raised with him. It's just not, it's not, it goes beyond even the point of you being promised that even if you die. No, no. Even right now, why you are alive, the fact that you have his spirit on the inside of you, the good news is that you are also seated with him in heavenly places. According to Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 4, well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to verse 7. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7, says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We were dead in sin. I mean, we were dead, 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 dead in sin. And then he, he rescued us. And they put him in us. And then he raised us together when he resurrected him. And now we are seated with him in heavenly places. So that he can show to the ages to come the exceeding riches of his grace. The exceeding riches of his kindness. The exceeding riches of his love towards us. Because we are in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you, how is life treating you today? What is that obstacle that is standing in your way today? Who is that person that said you will only progress over their dead body? Tell them to, to invite the band said, because they are dead already, because you are going over to the other side. Where is that authority that has become a mountain that you seemingly cannot climb over? What is the name of that sickness or that disease or that illness or that issue that is causing you restlessness and sleeplessness? How long have you been trying to climb to the other side and every effort seems to just fall down in your face? I've got good news for you. Today is the last day. Today is the last time. Today is the last, last incident that you will experience such a thing. Why? Because he himself has been raised from the dead and you are in him, raised with him. He is seated in the heavenly places and you are seated with him in the heavenly places. He's not just sitting there hoping and wishing that you will walk in the fullness of his blessing for, for, so that you can enjoy the benefit of the sacrifice and this. No, 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 no. He is there ensuring that all that belongs to you, everything that pertains to you, everything that he died so that you can have, none of them is denied of you. Every of your inheritance, every of my blessings, every of our of our soteria, our nothing missing and nothing broken. He's not just sitting there saying, well, when well, you're ready, go. no. He's sitting there to say, no, 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 don't touch that. I've already allocated that to him. According to the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, he says, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You cannot. And you can, you will not be able to deny what is, nobody can deny you of what is rightfully yours. Why? Because it got your name on it, and he, the good shepherd, is watching over it to make sure nobody touches it. And as we begin to close, the good shepherd 
he also went ahead and made provision for your eternal home and my eternal home in the heavenly places. According to John 14 from verse 2 to verse 4, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. The fact that you and I, we are sheep in his fold. That we have chosen and elected for him to be a shepherd. It's a confirmation that we do forever and a day. We will never be destitute. We will never be homeless. We will never be hopeless. We will never be faithless. We will never be loveless. Why? His grace is always available to us. His power is always at our disposal. His authority is always in our hands. And the banner over our head is his love today. His promises. His covenants concerning you and I would never fail. Therefore, let me invite you on this resurrection day, on this Easter Sunday, rejoice, my friend. Rejoice, my friend, in the knowledge of this truth that you have. Revel in the understanding of this truth that you know. Keep your hope and your faith anchored on the word of God and the love of God because he, the good shepherd, he has promised and he will never fail. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you and there is nothing in hell, there is nothing on earth that can detach you, that can separate me from his love. Why? Because he is a good shepherd and to him alone be all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Glory be to God in heaven. Thank you. If you're in this service today and you don't know this good shepherd, well, it's a good day to know him. On this resurrection day, would you accept the gift of his righteousness? Would you allow him by his spirit to, to indwell you so that you too can become party to this benevolent shepherd and enjoy the blessing thereof. So if that is you, just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't know you. But today I make a change. I make a decision. Today, I confess my sin. I ask for your forgiveness, that you wash me clean with your blood. I invite you, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. And from this day forward, I will follow you. I will serve you. And I will obey you. Thank you for saving me. Because now I know I'm a child of God. My eternity is secured. And my name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. To you alone be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.